Welcome to the Tetraki Business Revolution podcast. My name is Rob Yates, and together with my co-founder, Mark Hopkins, we're going to be coming to you at least twice a week with groundbreaking business revolutionary podcasts. In these podcasts, we're going to be bringing to you true business revolutionaries. That people who've done it differently, done it their way, had success, achieved more than the rest, and are willing to share with you exactly how they went about doing it. As well as that, Mark Hopkins, my co-founder, and I will be bringing you podcasts where we give you information about what it is we're doing to grow a business from one country across five continents in just four years. My name is Mark Hopkins, and I am thrilled to share this interview of Robin Seeger. Robin is originally from Scotland and spends his time between the UK, Europe, and America. He is a successful businessman, best selling author, and broadcaster. He is known as a peak performance guru and a world class conference speaker. He has set up his first company, Seeger International, with the sole aim of teaching people within organizations to develop themselves and reach their full potential. He is the author of four books, including the international bestseller, Natural Born Winners, which has sold in over 70 countries and translated into 16 languages. And it also was turned into a number one rated television series. He also released the book, Silent Mind Golf. And this is where I first came in touch with Robin. This book not only changed my golf score, but also changed how I look at so many things in my life. He holds a world record for the coldest round of golf ever played, 18 holes at minus 26 degrees centigrade in Fairbanks, Alaska. With no further ado, welcome to the podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Tetricky Business Revolutionary Club. Our free to join, no catches, no commitments, no credit card membership program that brings to you twice a month loads of Free content, interviews, early releases of podcasts, strategies, actionable content that you can put into place for yourself, your business, or possibly your team to ensure that when your future arrives, it's one that you've designed and that you are truly happy with. To go and join the Revolutionary Club, it's free of charge. Go and look in the notes below in the description, find the link, click on it, or follow revolutionaryclub.tetricky.com and join today. Now, without further ado, let's step forwards into this session's amazing podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Business Revolutionary Podcast and a huge welcome to our guest today, Robin Seeger. I first heard of Robin a few years ago when I was recommended the book Silent Mind Golf. Now, at that time, I was going through quite a lot of grief and loss and the person who was guiding me through the process knew I loved my golf and told me to read it. Um, And as I'm sure most of us have in our lives, there are a few people that when they say, read this book, you you listen to them. And this person I listened to, and I went out and I bought the book. But at that stage, I wasn't quite ready for for reading the book. So it went on my shelf. And for the next few weeks, every day, that book just stared at me. And it sort of pulled me towards it every day, more and more and more until I took it off the shelf, sat down, and read it. And at that time, I read it through two lenses. I read it through my passion for golf, and I read it through dealing with the grief 
that I was going through at that stage. And this is what's so incredible about the book and the ability that Robin has as a writer is he impacted me in both facets. Um, and there are two books that I have bought multiple times for multiple people. The first book is Viktor Frankl, A Man's Search for Meaning. And the second book is Silent Mind Golf. And my dad and stepdad are massive fans and, are, and they categorically state it has taken multiple shots off their game. And after I read the book for the, the second time, I went out and played and it took six shots off my score. And uh, unfortunately, it cost me quite a lot of money in the 19th hole afterwards. But um, to take six shots off after reading the book once tells you the impact that this book has had on my life. And I'm sure that uh, the next hour is going to be incredibly impactful. So I'm really excited to spend the next hour with Robin and to talk to and learn from him. Um, so before we start, I would like to thank you, Robin, for, for writing Silent Mind Golf. I know you're, you've written multiple books, but I'd really like to thank you uh, for writing this book. Um, while, this Pleasure, book Mark. <laughs> while this book focuses on golf, anyone will get the benefits from digesting the concepts and exercises and applying them in all aspects of their life. I, for one, changed how I view certain situations in my life, having read the book, and just want to really pass a massive thanks for, for really changing my life in certain aspects that I never thought a book would do. So, Robin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for choosing to be here today um, and for sharing your insights, experiences, and wisdom with our audience. It's my pleasure to be with you, Mark, and thank you very much for the extraordinary complimentary things you've said about silent mind golf I uh, could do with hearing that every day that'll cheer me up but I'm delighted it worked for you it doesn't work for many people so thank you fantastic so um Robin and I in our in our discussions before this podcast I think we've identified a number of areas where we share common experiences and passions and we are going to go and go on a little journey we're going to go through a journey on how they've shaped Robin and and how we feel and Robin feels going to make a massive impact in your life. So, so Robin, we're going, to, we're going to start by going back a few years. You're a sprightly young man, but let's, let's go back to your childhood. And I really like you to, to think about sort of the memories that you have of your childhood that as you look back, go, oof, that could have been a little trigger in terms of how I've gone on to live my life. Well, I I come from a large family. I have uh, five siblings. I have five sisters and me. And uh, my father was a doctor. He's a general practitioner in Glasgow in Scotland. So I was the only son. I was a, the little prince. I wasn't the little prince, of course, but I, I was spoiled a little bit in as much as dad would give me one-to-one -one time. Now, he was a doctor. He worked very, very hard. And um, people liked him. He was very good at golf. And he was played in the British Amateur Championship in 1950. And when I was a boy growing up, I wanted to be my dad. You know, I wanted to be this man that people liked because he was good at golf. I wanted to be someone that made a positive difference in the lives of other people by making them better. Because people would come up to my dad. I'd be out and people would come up to my dad and say, well, Dr. Seeger, thank you for this or thank you for that. And I was very, this is what I want. So that was a huge trigger for me. That was a huge uh, aspiration for me was to be this role model. Now, we all have aspirations, but the most, the biggest impact is the one that influences the most, be it positive or negative. And I had this sort of role model who was my dad. So I remember age four years of age, sitting in the car with my father one evening and listening to a comedy show on the radio. He was laughing. And it made me think, kind of back from the surgery early to watch Laurel and Hardy. So what had a huge impact on me, and it, it stayed with me to this day, is I want to make people feel better, and I want to make people laugh or experience laughter and joy in their life. And that might sound very corny, but as a little boy, age four, saying my prayers at the end of the bed, like some character from an A.A. A. Milne book, I used to say, uh, God bless mum and dad and help me to become a funny man who makes people better. That's what I used to wish for. That is a fantastic memory to have. Um, and I know we're going we're gonna to touch on how that, that came to life and fruition in your later years. But 
One thing that you've just you've talked about there, which is I, I really like to sort of talk a little bit further with your experiences, especially that we're going to jump around as you go into your work you've done with the world's best golfers. And you, and you mentioned there the word or well, the, the statement role models. Um, and also what I find fascinating is you were talking about your observation of your dad in terms of how he behaved and how other people interacted based on his behavior. I'm, just, I'm very quickly just going to share a, a story that happened two weeks ago and, and get your thoughts on, on where we are current in current society. Um, my son is, is eight years old and he's a mad football fan, a little bit to my displeasure, but that's, a, that's another whole topic of conversation. And we went to this tournament recently. It was an under nine football tournament. Um, and I've got a real issue with the amount of pressure we put on children uh, around winning at such a young age. And at this tournament, there were big trophies um, to play for at an under nine tournament. And um, the pressure on the boys and the coaches almost led to fights. There was almost violence between parents and coaches around the, the refereeing decisions and the behavior and something based on the pressure of winning. And I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts in terms of, of the role models that parents and coaches and, and elite performers play on the next generation, building on what you just said about your dad there. Well, it's interesting. My, uh, my father was a person that just found joy in things. You know, he could find joy in the simplest things. So I wasn't brought up with a win at all cost mentality. This is many years ago. So I wasn't brought up with this, you, you have to win, win at all cost mentality. And what's happening now, and I'm seeing this more and more, is this idea is, I remember when I was a young fellow American saying to me, playing in a golf competition with this American guy, and it was a very tight match, and it came down 18, and I lost, I choked. And I said to him afterwards, well, I hope you'll, he said, I beat you. I said, you did, but at least I hope I was a, a good loser. And he said, well, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. And I hated that sense because what I say to people is that hockey is a game. Golf is a game. Soccer is a game. We play games for fun. Professional athletes play to win. Winning is, is everything to them. But if we allow people to stop having fun, especially young people, then what you create is this, absolute selfish mentality where it's all about me, 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 me. So when I was a young boy, I wasn't exposed to that. It was all about go out, son, have fun, you know, do your best, but be, and, be, and it was drummed into me. I remember uh, to be a good loser or to be a gracious loser. Mm. And I remember once I was a young junior and I had won a match seven and six on the golf course. I was about 10 years of age and my father was in the clubhouse with his friends sitting having a beer or something and I walked up with the other young boy I'd been playing with and my dad said how did you get on I said I I won seven and six you know and he went oh well did you play a nice game and he was like that as we drove home in the car he said never do that again never make somebody feel bad and it really stuck with me you know so so I, I think what you're telling me is no these parents they're living vicariously through their children and they're putting pressure on their children and they're putting pressure on the referee and they're, and it's stopping fun. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, it's, a, it's a big, I'm very worried about 10, 15 years time in terms of the impact they're having at the moment in terms of, like you said, this, this winner all costs mentality and, and not understanding the process that you need to put in place in order for the winning to happen. And again, what, what are we celebrating? Are we celebrating the lucky shot or are we celebrating the skills that you're developing over time, irrespective of it's sport or business or work or manners, for example? What are we actually celebrating and what are we focusing on? Yeah. Look, listen, let's be clear. We all like to win and we all like to come first. That's, but it's the cost and the price you pay that you have to be very careful about. You know, you can look at examples of Tiger Woods. You know, his win at all cost mentality. He lost his he lost his way. He lost his humanity. He lost his direction. He lost. I mean, the cost mm. to him. And I've just finished his bio, the unauthorized autobiography or biography. And some of the examples of his selfishness in the in the in the will to win is just. If you think if that was my child, I would just be appalled. But his father 
drilled it into him, be an assassin, be, it's all about you, it's win at all costs. Yeah, again, it goes back onto, onto role models. And um, as you say, obviously, your, your father played a, a major role in, in your life. Um, can you remember any other role models at a, at a young age that, um, that helped formulate the directions you're, you're going, you went on? And specifically, what is it that you remember about them that, that stayed with you today? It was when you're growing up, it, your role models were like late educators or hero figures from the world of sport. So I was a, a and growing up, there was a, one or two teachers at school who I really was inspired by. They were just very uh, fair. You know, I wasn't bright. I, was, I went to a very academic school. I got in due, due to a typing error. <laughs> and so I was always struggling. I mean, I was, there was these guys who would just breeze 90% in every exam, and I was struggling to get to 45 or 50. And I, there was one or two teachers that made me feel stupid. You know, they'd say, oh, you idiot, like this. And there were other teachers who'd always be, oh, good, this is good, well, well, well done. And those teachers who were very fair and encouraging had a huge impact on me, and they really made me try better. And when I often speak at conferences, I, 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 ask, I always ask the audience to think of their favorite teacher. And then I ask them five questions about their favorite teacher. And the five questions were, are, was this person passionate and enthusiastic about the subject they taught? Did they bring it to life for you? And people will go, yes. I said, and when you got a question right, did they say, well done? And they say, yes. And I said, when you got a question wrong, were they still sympathetic, empathetic, and encouraging. They went, yeah. I said, question four, did they like you? And people go, yeah. I said, question five, did you like them? They go, yeah. I said, so it's yes, 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 yes. And if I asked you what the teacher said or what the teacher did after all these years, you don't remember. Mm. But if I asked you today how the teacher made you feel 15, 20, 30, 40 years later, you still remember that. So what I, my heroes and the people when I was growing up made me feel that I was capable, made me feel good. So my heroes were one or two teachers at school, my father, Jack Nicholas, the golfer, because he was just winning everything. I mean, you just wanted to be Jack Nicholas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the world of movies, you know, it was always the comedians. It was Groucho Marx, the Lauren Hardy, it was Bob Hope, people that this ability to make people feel happy. So that was, that was very influential on in me as a young boy growing up. I didn't want to be the toughest kid in the block. You know, that wasn't my aspiration uh, and that, yeah that's curious that uh, I wasn't my role models weren't soldiers or military men I, obviously I used to read tons of books on explorers so Scott of the Antarctic Ernest Shackleton Rowan Amundsen I used to think Hillary and Tenzing climb so all these people that did things that had never been done before that really inspired me to do things that hadn't been done before yeah it's interesting in terms of what what drives us to do things more and what are the people that make us feel what we want to feel? And I think it's sometimes we put those two things into the same bucket and, and get them a little bit, a bit confused. And it's interesting your, your statement there about feeling. And I think it's something that we do as a, as a community. We don't spend enough time on, um, on Sunday. I, celebrated or celebrated probably not the right word but we I had a, an anniversary of a, a loss and it wasn't feeling that good and um, I didn't communicate this anniversary to anybody we had a, a hockey match and one of my players a friend of mine said he just had a sense about me and he said right we're going out for dinner we're going for dinner um, he had no idea whatever why I was feeling that I went back and then he very kindly paid for dinner um, and I sent a message afterwards just to say, thank you so much. You have no, I've explained the anniversary and he goes, you have no idea how you made me feel. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting concept that we probably need to think a little bit more about of how actually are we making other people feel rather than what are we doing for those people? The number one question I get asked in my professional life, Mark, is how do I motivate, not me personally, those people say to me, Robin, how do I motivate my boss? to listen to my ideas? How do I motivate my team to be more proactive in generating business? How do I motivate my colleagues to pass me the ball during the match? How do I motivate my wife to want to travel abroad? You know, 
this is the question, motivation. Mm. And when people talk about motivation, they normally think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They think about you know the motivation to be alive and to survive. Yeah. But the research, and I, won't, I can't, don't have time to go into the detail of it, but the research has been done on what motivates individuals in life to do their best, to perform at their highest level. And the number one motivator in life is the need to be appreciated. That's it. The need to feel valued, to be loved, to be cared about, but the need to be appreciated. So number two after that is the need to be understood. And number three is the need to feel involved or included. Number four comes money and financial gain. But the need to be loved, the need to be understood, and the need to be involved. Now, those are very simple things to do. And if you think of why we form associations, clubs, relationships, groups, collectives, it's all about this. So when your friend said to you, I'm going to, let's go for dinner, and then he buys you dinner, did you feel appreciated? Mm, did, you, did, you, did you think he understood you? Yeah, and definitely. those three things were there. So the impact it had on you is it made you feel, I mean, feel pretty good. And I, I say this time and time again to, to companies, motivating your staff isn't difficult. It really isn't difficult. You know, if you paid your everyone in the company 100% more money, if you doubled everybody's salary tomorrow, you wouldn't double output, you wouldn't double productivity, you wouldn't double profit. Yet, if you were to make people feel highly included by asking their opinion, if you were to listen to their problems to let them know you understand them, and if you were to appreciate what they did when they did it well, you'd get more out of them. It's, it's, it was kind of simple. Yeah, and that's that's probably part of the challenge because it is so simple. Um, sometimes, I, again, my experience with the clients I've been I've worked with, where you you give them something that is simple, the fear of implementing something that is so simple, because I, I always question why didn't you see more environments actually fulfilling those needs of their employees and obviously employees are the, it's the greatest cost to any company why wouldn't you do everything in your power to fulfill to motivate your staff to fulfill their needs yeah you know but john you know the, the the truth is mark is that the hr department in every company which they always say you know i can't tell you i've gone to too many conferences with the chief executive goes are the people are our, our, our greatest resource. Our, our people are our greatest resource. And I'm sitting there and I'm rolling my eyes, my head laughing. <laughs> no, it's not. Because yeah. if you really believe that to be true, you would invest money in your H, your human resource department. Now, a human resource department is always seen as a cost center, not a profit center. And because of the cost center, they try to control the budget. But it's just, it's, it's, it is just bonkers to me that uh, when they talk about, you know, motivating the staff or developing it, they just go, it's lip service. More often than not, it's lip service. People get sent to courses that don't really make them feel valued, included, or appreciated. Yeah, and, and when times are tough, the first thing that gets cut is training, leadership courses. Training, and then... human resources, external events. I don't know. Tell me about it. <laughs> the congruence in there just makes me laugh, unfortunately. Uh, so let's let's move on. So uh, you finished schooling now. You've done your went to university and did a degree yeah, in science. I went, to, I went to university to do human biology. I wanted to do medicine, but I was never going to get in. I didn't get the grades. I went to university, and and ten weeks after I got to university, or forty weeks after I got to university, I got a phone call to tell me my father had died at the age of fifty-two of a brain hemorrhage, mm -hmm. and I was absolutely knocked off me. I just, I, I just. Now, this is over 40 years ago, and in those days, there was no grief counselling as a student. It was like, um, so I came home, went to the funeral, less than a week later, I was back at university, and no one said anything. And I was very lost and going through grief and distress, and I, I st st struggled through that year, struggled through the next year, then I dropped out. I was not going to get my degree, so I dropped out. But I um, had a fascination as a young boy um, from remember my saying my night prayers, I wanted to be a person that made people laugh, and yep. I started writing for comedy shows for radio and television. That's what I started to do, and uh, I'd sell a joke for nothing, a couple of pounds, mm -hmm. and then I went to the comedy store in London, where I then started to do open mic spots, and then I got booked as a comedian, and for so six years, seven years after that, I was a stand-up comedian. And I worked in America, Boston, New York, Los Angeles. I worked in London, uh, got a TV show. And so that dream I'd had, that, that goal I'd put in my head as a four-year-old boy and repeated every night for seven years. 
as, as a goal at a very high, deeply subconscious level, never stopped being aspired to. And I ended up becoming a stand-up comedian. And so that's that was hugely helpful to me later on in my life. And we'll come on to that later. That is fascinating how, and again, it's, it's an interesting thing to be talking about with, with uh, children and the, and the young. I remember doing, did a work uh, at school and I was talking about dreams and visions to a, a class of about 30, 16, 15 year olds. Uh, tough crowd. That's yeah. a tough, that's a tough <laughs> Yes, probably the hardest, hardest one no, no, I've ever done. They, there's, there's no fake smiles or fake interest. If you haven't, you know, that, I tell that to every person that wants to be a speaker, go and talk to 16 year olds. If, if they listen, you've got it. Yeah, to try and keep them occupied. I think it was 90 minutes I, I had them for. It was a, it was a real challenge. But what was, was fascinating is um, I did a, a, like a, a vision setting one and, um, and asked the open-ended question, what have you dreamt about being for a long time? And this one guy said he wanted to be a, a DJ. And all his uh, classmates sort of giggled and laughed and stuff like that. And then we did a, a little exercise where I got him to close his eyes and he described it. And we started, and again, going back into your feelings. And we brought all his senses into it with his eyes closed. And he was mesmerized in terms of seeing things in his vision, smelling things. And I, the class were quiet for three or four minutes, just observing this one guy, feeling, smiling, imagining it. And it's a, it's a very, very powerful tool at a young age to get. So... How, how, do you, how do you manifest that out with, um, with goal setting with, uh, at a young age? And, and, and how does that play out? And obviously with you, it was incredibly successful. Well, I didn't know I was goal setting, Mark. That's a, that's a curious thing. I didn't know. I didn't realize then what I now know. But I'll tell you another thing that was very interesting was I went to this, I mentioned I went to an academic school. <clears throat> so I really struggled. I mean, I really had to struggle, struggle, struggle. And I always expected that I would fail. No, I always thought, oh, no, God, I'm not going to get this exam. I'm, I'm, I can't get my French. I'm not good at French. So what I discovered is all the things I expected to fail at. So when I got into university, which astounded my headmaster, I mean, it really did, because I, I was really in the thicky section. I went there thinking, well, I'm definitely going to fail. There's no way I can get through this, because I'd conditioned myself to expect to fail. Hmm. And what I learned in my life, is even golf, sport, relationships, everything that I expected to fail, I failed at, without exception. Everything that I predetermined or pre-imagined I would fail at, I, I did fail at. Everything I imagined I could succeed at, I succeeded at. Now, I'm not into this notion that you ask the universe of what you want and it gives it to you. I don't, you know, I want a six pack and a Ferrari. It's not going <laughs> to yeah. happen. But well, six what I might. <laughs> uh, six pack might. But what, what was interesting for me was I recognize now that I was goal setting at a very powerful level. So the things that I could see myself doing, like being a comedian, no problem. I never doubted that could happen. I could never see myself as a doctor. I could never see it because everybody said, Oh, Robin, maybe medicine's not for you. Maybe you're not that bright. And I believe them. And I, I now teach my clients belief before behavior. Hmm. Don't start behaving in a certain way. Believe, and the behaviors will automatically form themselves thereafter. And so for me now, goal setting, I don't like to teach goal setting um, as I used to. Uh, I'm very much more about waypoints. Your life's a journey, and you have to plan your waypoints. And each waypoint is critical because if you don't get to the first one, you can't get to the second one. You can't shortcut it. But the the... If you, and I say to people, when you look down this future you have for yourself, it goes over the horizon. There's no end point. Mm. And, and we'll talk about this later. I think having a goal, if you set a goal and you reach it, the number of people that go, how many people fit across the marathon finishing line and immediately stop running? Yeah. Because you're done. Where you see some people, they cross the line and they just keep running out, which is a, a better way to be. Yeah, and there's a couple of things that you've just reminded me of as you've talked about there, especially around belief. Um, recently coached at Commonwealth Games and you obviously go into a tournament of that looking at your opposition and we played against Australia, who's the number one ranked team in the world. 
So obviously you're going into that game knowing you have to put in a real a performance that is as close to your optimal performance as possible in order to, to compete at that level. Uh, and we did. We put in a great performance. We're all very, very proud of, of that performance. But then to back it up with another performance where you're playing, which on paper is an inferior team because they're at a lower world ranking, we weren't able to put that same level of performance in because the belief was different in terms of the opposition that we're facing. And it's, I find it fascinating in, in terms of performance. And we'll, we'll talk sure. about your, your guru status as, as in peak performance. But again, how, and again, because that's in all aspects of our lives. It's, oh, absolutely. No, no, no. Absolutely. Here's a curious thing. I don't expect to know the answer to this question, but when I say to people, who are the most confident people in the world? And I said at conferences, I was in Sri Lanka a few weeks ago, I asked the same question. And I said, who are the most confident people in the world? And people will say heart surgeons, or they'll say uh, people that test parachutes or bomb disposal technicians. Eight-year-old boys. And I said, no, no. It's the most confident people in the world are four-year-old children. Statistically, yeah. four-year-old children have the highest levels of confidence. Because by the age of four, they've learned to walk, to talk, to dress themselves, do the potty, feed themselves, climb a ladder, get up and sing in front of an audience of people. You're born with two fears, a fear of loud noise and a fear of falling. You have no other fears. You learn fears as you go through life. You learn to be af afraid of losing, afraid of rejection, afraid of dying, afraid. Of... But we're not born with those fears. We acquire those fears. For the first four years of life, all a child hears is you're clever, you're pretty, you're smart, you're strong, you're, you're a princess, you're a prince, aren't you clever, aren't you good? It's this wonderful positive feedback they get continually. So when they're learning to walk, they're falling over 240 times, but at no point do they lie on the floor going, I'm not doing this anymore. Get me the TV remote controls and cans of beer, Dad. I'm making a life for myself right here. They don't. They just believe that they can do this. They believe. So this belief before behavior. As adults, by the age of 18, less than 2% of the population still have high self-esteem and self-confidence. It's about 1.2% still have a great sense of I can do anything. And these are the people that become, I believe, the, the world-class athletes, the peak performers, the entrepreneurs, the world changers, the game changers, because they have this belief, and that belief's infectious. And it's uh, so the team, when you're talking about you're playing world number one, they all believe that, okay, these are the number one, but uh, we believe we can give them a match. Yeah. We believe that we can show them how good we are. When they play the team who's ranked way below them, they go, ah, we're going to beat them easily. But they've forgotten that that team is believing we can beat this team ranked number six. We can be, you know, so belief is so important. So when I was young, I had these beliefs that impacted my life um, in a very negative way until I got, I got it because I was a stand-up comedian. I was, and I got a TV show and I didn't believe the TV show would happen. I said, I bet they can. And the TV show did happen, but they, can't, they pulled me off the show. So they pulled me off the show saying, well, we don't think you fit in with the rest of the, the you know, so and I was going, oh. Then I get diagnosed with cancer. I get diagnosed with, uh, I think, called Hodgkin's disease in, in hospital. And I tell the story that four questions popped into my head. I'm lying in the hospital bed and four questions popped into my head. And the four questions are, why are rich people rich? And the second question is, why are happy people happy? And the third question is, why are successful people successful? And the fourth question is, why am I none of these three people? <laughs> And I determined if I get out of hospital, I'd get the answer to those questions. And that's what set me off to explore why I had the beliefs I had. And I spent two years reading, researching everything I could get my hands on. And two years later, I'd become a, a, a producer at BBC Television as the head of the entertainment development part of the business. And people said to me, Robin, you've been so lucky. And I said, lucky, nothing to do with it. Yeah. And this is why I'm trying to get people to understand. Of course, in, 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 in the sports, you coach, hockey, and my, the, people will get luck. You all have a lucky break. Of course you do. But luck's not a strategy or something you can rely on. It's something you can take advantage of. That's all luck is. Luck is the Roman philosopher Seneca said, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. And if you're prepared and the opportunity is there, that's luck. But you don't, you, luck isn't a strategy to win the world championship. A hundred percent. Yeah, well, as a golfer, I forgot what you said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Well, that's been attributed to Jack, Gary Player, but it's been, yeah. now been attributed to this, but, everyone, but I think Gary Player said it originally, the, luck, the more I practice, the luckier I get. I think, and it goes back to the 
Malcolm Gladwell's ten thousand hours and all those things. Um, just uh, going back to your questions, then uh, fascinating questions. Where do you think those questions came from? I, you know, it's interesting because they really just popped into my head, and there was a sense of I had a terrible sense. I'm 29, eight years of age. I'm in hospital. I have a terrible sense of failure. You know, I failed at school. My golf never got to the level. I played for the university, but that's a more of a reflection on the poor standard than my good play. I played, I played twenty, I played twenty-three singles matches at the university. I lost every one. <laughs> and on my twenty-fourth match, I was two up with three to go, and I lost that too. I, I believed I, I, I can't win. So I think, and then I went into comedy. I didn't get the TV show. And I'm thinking, there's a speaker in America, I think his name is Randy Gage, who once said when anything went wrong in his life, there was always one person at the scene of the accident. And I was always there. I'm thinking, there's got to be something I'm doing. So those questions came from my subconscious mind. I think it's really uh, it's interesting We, in terms of so uh, it's these life-changing events that uh, some of us go through are a lot of the time the triggers for making you look at things slightly differently. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm interested in, in how, in your advice to, to the listeners of helping them understand what are those, those triggers that they can utilize in order to maybe come up with the questions because not everyone knows how to ask the right question. So how, how, would, you, how would you go about working with someone who's, who's at that stage where they have this sixth sense that there's something that they need to look at differently, but are struggling to make that step or struggling to unpack what that question is they need to answer? Well, I have a simple exercise. I give someone a pencil and I say to them, this isn't a pencil, it's a magic wand. And if you could wish for the life that you, you, you really want to have in two years from today, so in two years from today, I want to be sitting here with you and everything you tell me now, has happened what would you want that to be because I think Mark one of the biggest problems people have and this question that triggers I get asked before is it's not the wrong question it's a great question but most people don't know what they want mm. and what I mean by that is most people would say to you um, well, I, I'll give you an example if I give you a pen and paper a crayons and said Mark can you draw me a red hot air balloon with a basket I reckon in 20 seconds, you could draw me a red, a hot air balloon, color it in, little basket. Yep. And I said, can you put two stick people in there? You draw two little stick people. That's very easy. You've just drawn a hot air balloon with two stick people waving at you. Here's a piece of paper. Draw me better. Draw me happy. Draw me successful. These are random words. These are abstract words. How do you draw successful? How do you draw happy? How do you draw better? And what happens is people will say to you as a coach or me as a coach, I want to be better. I, I, I want to be more successful. And I don't think that's such an abstract concept. It, it, uh, so my kind of thing is, what is, it you, what is it you want? Tell me what you want to achieve in two years' time. Tell me. And that helps individuals and organizations focus. And I say, if we can't draw what you want by the end of the session, we haven't got it. You know? So what does happy look like? Well, we can figure out what would make you happy. Uh, want to be successful. How do you define success? And what would be a way that we can measure and mark your success? And um, so that's where, I, that's where I start from. Well, that's where I would start from. Um, so because I think that once you've done that, the triggers are easy to, are much easier to identify because, look, everyone wants to be happier, richer, thinner, healthier, more successful. That's a pretty fair assessment. But... What does it look like and how do we get there? And I think for a lot of people, what they do is they, they look at their life and they go, I'm not fit, I'm not well off, I'm not in a job that I love, the relationship's not, oh, I can't climb this mountain. Mm. I, I, I don't know what, Rob and I don't know where to start. And I go, wait, 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 wait. It's easy. We just have to break it down. Uh, so for me, the, the triggers are fundamentally, we're triggered by something we want more of or less of. I want less pain, less sadness, less poverty. I want more joy, more money, more happiness. So we have to identify 
the triggers. Now, if the triggers are of the negative variety, I want less poverty, less sadness, less. We tend to sh- step back. We shrink. We don't. I, I don't want to be. Well, I don't want more pain. I don't want more suffering. And we we tend to. So I think the motivation of fear is a much more powerful but paralyzing motivation than the motivation of joy. So we're motivated towards or away. You know, we're and the the motiva- the emotion of pain and suffering is much more powerful than the emotion of joy and reward. So most people can't imagine the joy and reward as easily as they can imagine pain and suffering. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, I, yeah. Sorry, Karen. So, so, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just about to finish. Um, so what I my thing is to get people to focus on what they want. So if I say to someone, what do you want? What kind of job do you want? And they say to me, well, I don't want a boring job. I don't want a job where I'm in an office. I said, stop. I'm not asking you what you don't want. So I don't want to have any conversation about what you don't want. We're wasting your time and my money, or your money and my time. Tell me what you want. And then you'll find people go, oh, well, then they, well, I want to be happy. Okay, let's break that down. Yeah, it's, fa- I'm, it's fascinating what you're saying, because I'm, as I'm listening, I'm pulling together the, the things that you've talked about so far, about the fact that four-year-olds are the most confident, and then we... We expose them to a world of fears, which then impacts them as they grow older. And then when we challenge people or we're supporting people to look into the future and articulate what they want, they're naturally gravitating to something that they're scared of doing. To also, I'm, In my mind, I'm, there's a number of things that's going through my head. One is, can you imagine what a world would be like if no one had fears? Um, do you think it would be... Uh, do you think people could cope if they didn't have fears? And finally, as you talked about the concept between fear and joy and which is the greater motivator, do we need fear in the short term in order to enjoy the longer term joys that is going to motivate us? So, so bombarding you then as I'm sort of bringing everything together that you're talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, look, I, I, it's quite natural to fear as part of our psyche. So there's, I used to skydive. And there was one or two people I met with 10, 12,000 jumps and tell me at every jump they get nervous. So there was a, a little fear there with what could go wrong. I would meet people with 300 jumps who were fearless, uh, who were absolutely fearless. Can I get that? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'll pick that up again for your editing. So I used to skydive, and there were people who had 10,000 jumps who would tell me they were nervous, so they were experiencing fear. And there were people with two or 300 jumps who were high-fiving and yahooing it before they got in the aircraft, and they would say they're not afraid, they're not, there's no fear. They were the people that got injured. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the fear has a purpose. Fear protects us. Uh, I think it's where we give our where we give our focus. It's like the story of the young boy who says to his father, "Father, in my heart are two wolves. One wolf is fear, and one wolf is courage. Which one will win?" And he goes, "The one you feed the most." So my suggestion is we shouldn't feed our fear. Fear is quite. It keeps us alive. It stops us jumping off high buildings. It stops us doing silly things. But I think some f- fears are very valid, and some are imagined. And it's the imagined fears when we project to the future that are going to hold us back. So if you wanted to start a business and someone said, well, you could go bankrupt, you could lose your house. And what happens if your debt, what happens if your supplier goes out of business? What happens if you make, you know, and you're going, oh my God, what happens if all these, (laughs) that's where it's unhelpful. Yeah. But fear has a very good purpose. It keeps us alive and stops us doing that things. Cool. So let's, um, we've obviously talked about the foundations that have been put into place um, and we, in the conversation we've been touching on performance and we've started talking a little bit about um, the triggers, uh, the stuff. So fast forward now to, to Robin Seeger, the peak performance guru. Um, how would you, what was your definition of, of peak performance? I think peak performance to me is 
the ability to perform to your best <clears throat> whilst under the greatest pressure. You know, we can all perform very well on the practice range. We can perform very well at home when we're just, you know, telling jokes around the dining room table. When we put you in the first tee of the Open Golf Championship, <clears throat> or we put you on a stage with a microphone and 1,800 people in the audience, mm -hmm. that's pressure. Your ability to perform at the same level um, in competition that you can do in practice is, for me, peak is, is the definition of peak performance. Peak performance is performing to your maximum ability whilst under the greatest pressure. And um, so going back again to what you said previously about the 1.2% of the ones that you believe are the ones who actually go on to make it, um, mm -hmm. and talking then about peak performance and the ability to perform under pressure. Uh, I know we share a similar probably frustration around um, a lot of individuals who talk a good game, who go out, they read the books, they do the courses, but they miss a, a really important part of performance, uh, which is actual the action part. So do you want um, to share, share your thoughts on, on that? Yes. I mean, I, I went to a conference and I, and I said, uh, how many people in this room? I've got a, I, I think I put out 100 pounds. I said, look, and it was, it was a, a sales force of about 300 young people. I said, I'll give £100 or £200 to any man that can come up on the stage and show the audience a ripped six-pack, I mean, a really good six-pack. And nobody came up. And I said, that's interesting, isn't it? How many people in this room don't know how to get a six-pack? I said, you know how to get a six-pack. You go on a, a low-carb, high-protein diet. You do between four to 600 sit-ups at least four times a week. You work the obliques, all the different muscles that were gripping this. And I said, so you know how to do it, but you don't have it. And the reason is, is because it's very hard to do. It's, it takes a com huge amount of action and commitment. And for me, the key word there is commitment to taking action. And I think most people are still looking for a shortcut, the quick, you know, six, you know, Five minute abs. Well, can we do four minute abs? You know, well, it's, of course, we're not with three minute abs. And so it, we're all looking for a shortcut, and there are no shortcuts to great golf. There are no shortcuts to great performance. I mean, it's just a fact of life. It's the one thing, <clears throat> having met uh, high altitude mountaineers, having met explorers, having met top 10 professional golfers and other sports, the one thing they have, I mean, Nadal. Um, Federer, um, Djokovic, when you listen to their training regime, I mean, Djokovic says that he can tell you what he's having for breakfast 300 days in the future. He knows, I mean, he has one day off, it's Christmas Day. And when he finishes a training session with his coach, he's not allowed to leave the tennis court until he serves a ball that knocks over a can of, a fizzy drinks can, like a Coke can. He's got a Hit it until he hits it. You can't leave the you can't leave the tennis court. So it's that for a bit, it's practice and it's taking action. So it's the theory practice gap. The example I love to use when I'm talking to audiences is, you know, imagine you're walking down the street and you bump into another man, and the man turns around and he squares up to you. He wants to fight you, and you say to this man, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! I better warn you. I've read 25 books in karate." <laughs> the man says well i've just had two boxing lessons who has the advantage yeah the guy that said the two lessons he can put action he can put action theory into practice so that's my short answer or long answer yeah it's in, again just um it's interesting that djokovic is a, is a great story and i can imagine some of our listeners going that's great but djokovic has a coach, he has a sports masseuse, he has a dietitian, he has all that support network around him to help him be uh, one of the top tennis players that's ever lived. Us, us mere mortals don't have that luxury and therefore it's harder for us to stay committed. What, what practical things would you uh, say to those people who, who are pushing back and saying, well, I don't have that support network in place? Uh, two things. I would say keep a, keep, a, keep a paper copy, keep a diary, journal, or whatever you want to call it, 
in my board, in my office, I have a, you know, I have to do exercises every day. And you, you make a note, you put the three, you take, you've done the exercises. I almost look at that board and if there's red, if there's takes missing, I'm like, ooh, mm. ooh, I don't want that. So make yourself accountable to yourself in a very simple way. That's one thing I get to do. And the second thing is something is always better than nothing. So even a bad session at the gym is better than no session at the gym. A sort of a half-hearted jog is better than no jog. You know, five cold calls made to clients is better than no cold calls made to clients. So something, do something, because you will always, at the end of our life, we don't regret our failures. It is our regrets that we regret. It's the regrets for not doing it when we had the chance. So, you know, Djokovic didn't start off with a, a team, Team Djokovic. He started off as a 10-year-old kid, you know, <clears throat> trying to make it in the business. And he, he took every chance he could to practice. So I think that, you know, it's how bad did you want it? I had a situation in America where a very wealthy Chinese family wanted me to coach their 15-year-old son who was a, very gifted amateur. He wasn't phenomenal, but he was a gifted amateur player. And so I sat down with his family and they had a translator there. And after 40 minutes, and the whole time I'm talking, Mark, this kid's on his iPhone, or he's just, he's not paying any attention. And the kids are saying, we want him to be a champion. We want this, this, and how'd you work? And we, we, I chat away. And at the end of the 40 minutes, they said, so, um, and how much do you charge? I said, well, that's not really important because I'm not going to work with your son. And then immediately he puts the phone down, he looks at me, he spoke prep, he understood English, he went to American school. And they said, why not? I said, you cannot feed a man who's not hungry. Hmm. Your son is not hungry. And that's, you've got him the hunger. You know, I can't give you hunger. I, if you're hungry, I can serve you lots of food. I can teach you to cook. I can take you shopping. I can show you to forage. I can really do lots to help you. But if you're not hungry, I can't give you an appetite. Yeah, it goes back to what you were saying earlier around a pen and paper and writing out what do you want your next two years to look like. And I know from um, it's something that inspires me every day. So in my a bit like you, I have I have things in my house that are very visual. So I've got my vision board up, which every oh, morning I walk past my vision board, and my vision board has base camp of Everest, it has the Olympic rings, it has the Vienna uh, concert hall on. It has a map of the world with all my visions that I want to achieve. And on the back of each piece of paper has a, a rough number, which is the cost it's going to do in order to get to these things. Because getting to base camp is a, a cost associated with it. Um, but then it's unpacking those costs to say, what are the actions I'm going to take today that's going to ensure that I'm working towards, towards that vision? I think it's interesting what we talked about at the start. Um, I agree with you in terms of um, goal setting. Uh, I'm, I feel visions are much more powerful than goals because it's... I agree. We think visually. We think visually. And I think also, um, you know, I know a few people who climbed Mount Everest and they all said it was fantastic to get there, but almost anticlimactic because once you've, you've been spending years dreaming of it, you get there, it's like, well, now what? You know, what do I do now? And some of them go on to do other things and some some don't. But, I, I, you know, I think that life has taught me what you put in is what you get out. It's like saving money at the bank, putting the money in, you're not getting any money out. But if you put enough money in, you'll get interest and you get money out. So, and life is no different. You know, if you don't, I think the greatest curse in life is to be phenomenally naturally talented and have it come to you too easy. And the world is full of sports people who were child phenoms. Mm. And then suddenly, where are they now? And yet the guys and the girls who were always in the top 20 but never doing much as a teenager, they're the ones that suddenly break through because they want it. They really, really want it. Yeah, it goes back to what you were saying, action. It's they're the ones who, who are willing to put in who, that, that extra bit of effort that, um, that actually made them world-class. And it probably goes back to what you're talking about, happy, successful, all those, those trigger questions that you're asking. Yeah, I think so. And when I was in Florida, I got to know many golfers there. And, 
you would be amazed how hard the top 10 players in the world practice. You know, you think the top 10, they don't need to practice. The top 10 golfers practice more than the, the you know, if you look at the guys one to 10, I promise you they practice a lot more purposely. Not necessarily, they don't practice harder, but they practice with a greater sense of purpose than the people who's like ranked 90 to 100. You know, because the people who are 90 to 100 think, I need to do five hours today, so they go and hit balls. Well, that's not practicing. Now, I say this to them, I said, you're not practicing, you're hitting balls. And they look at me and they go, what, what do you mean? I said, okay, I want you on every, I want you to go to the range today for an hour. I want you to hit 40 shots. That's it. They go, well, I normally hit 600 over three hours. I go, I don't want you to do that. I want to hit 40 shots over one hour. But I want you to treat every shot as though it is the approach shot to the 72nd green at the Masters Championship when you have a one-shot lead. I want you to engage your smell, your feel, the ground under your feet, your emotions, your heart. I want you to feel that this is the most important shot of your life and practice that. I say now you're practicing with purpose because otherwise you're just hitting balls and hitting balls it's not going to make you a better player under pressure. It'll make you probably more mechanical and repeat the swing, but it won't make you better under pressure. You have to practice with purpose. And so in our life, our business life, we have to act with purpose. You know, is, is this phone call taking me closer or further away from what I want? So if you're in the office for two hours, you can go on Facebook and look at what your friends are doing for 20 minutes, or you can spend the two hours on LinkedIn, or you can spend two hours calling clients, or you spend to our sending emails. And I think a lot of people think they're working when they're just hitting balls. It's a, it's a, it's a great analogy. I love that um, vision of purpose. And I think there's, there's two things that you've really talked about that I really like to stress. One is this uh, being able to peak performance about performing under pressure. Um, and especially, and that second point you just made now about practice with purpose, uh, live your life with purpose. I think I love, I love the standard response whenever you say to someone, how are you? Oh, I'm busy. It's just the most, and uh, the two words I cannot stand in the English language at the moment is busy and fine. Busy tells me nothing and fine tells me absolutely nothing. What are yeah. you busy with? Uh, busy doing nothing. Busy doing nothing. Yeah, That's so um, as we sort of, we start to we wrap up um, our, our conversation, I just really want to, focus a couple of questions around silent mind golf um the book and more importantly the impact um both of obviously as i as i said in the introduction how this book impacted me both on my on the golf course by taking six shots off which was just unheard of um and the shots all came from my approach place but it was nothing to do from the tee box it was nothing to do on the greens it was i found six greens more than i did my previous round um, and it was all about those three things about focus, faith, and, and presence. Um, yeah. as, as you wrote the book, um, I'm assuming, and, and correct my assumption if I'm wrong, that the, some of the, the, the input to the book was obviously golf related, but also from your experience off the golf course. And, and can you just explain to me how those two things come together? Well, what was interesting for me is I used to play golf at my university. My handicap was seven or eight. And, I got, ended up with a handicap about 16 or 18, and I was playing golf with a friend in Scotland, and he said, you used to be a good golfer. I said, oh, I still am. He says, hey, you play like a, you're not very good. And I thought, he's, he said, but you, you lecture, you write books of motivation. You should know better than anyone how to fix this. And I went, oh. and it was almost, and I mean this seriously, it was almost like a eureka moment. I mean, within two seconds, I went, I know what I need to do. And what it was is I need to play golf the way I drive my car. I need to play golf the way I put my socks on in the morning. I need to play golf the way that I, um, you know, make a cup of tea, which means automatically without thought and with confidence. And it made me realize in golf and in life that there's a lovely quotation, which I have in my slide deck. And I finish it with whoever I'm speaking to. And it says, if we live in the future, it makes us anxious. Mm. If we live in the past, that makes us sad. And what I realized was I spent my time on the golf course upset about a bad shot I just hit or worrying about a hole that was coming up that I knew was always a problem for me. 
And I realized that, you know, when you play, if you play darts in a pub or with your friends, you don't look at the, you don't look at your arrow, you're looking at the dartboard. If you're an archer, you're not looking at the bow, you're looking at the target. You know, if you're a footballer, you're not looking at your feet, you're looking at the, where you, the ball is going to go, you just know where the ball is. And I realized that in golf, that we, it's everything so cluttered. So I've, I decided to, to make down to these three things, focus on the outcome, not the process. That's focus. Faith was believe you can make the shot. If you don't believe, then you can't achieve. And the third one was the hardest one is be present in the moment. Be holy in that moment. There's no past or future. It's just this moment. When I show this book to my skydiving instructor, he goes, this is the book on skydiving. This is what skydiving is about. When I talked to one or two business guys I knew, they said, well, this is why I run my business. I focus on what we want. I believe we can do it. And we, we, we our attention's always on what we're doing there and then. So... It's a, it's a kind of universal application. And one of the challenges is because it appears so simple, people, the results you give me are quite common. People say it took two, three, four, five, six shots off my round. And then I, six months later, I go, how's it going? He says, oh, I'm, it's, I'm going, because they've stopped doing it. And I say to them, are you, are, you, are you meditating? Are you doing the process? Are you visualizing? Well, no, no, because I know how to do that. I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> I said, so... Let me get this right. If you got a six pack, would you stop doing abdominal exercises? I said, that's when you have to keep doing them. So that, I think it's a universal application. Yeah, and, that, and that's the challenge with society, isn't it? And um, I've got lots of frustrations at the moment where we are bombarded by these individuals who are selling courses saying the six steps to have a business worth one million overnight and stuff like that. And they forget to tell you the... 10 or 15 years of hard graft they've put in there until they got to that tipping point. And oh, absolutely. And I would say to people who listen to your podcast is be very, very suspicious of people selling you um, shortcuts and quick riches. You know, we will show you how to build an internet funnel, how to build $200,000 business in six weeks. They're, if, they, if they knew how to do it, they'd be doing it. What they're doing is they're giving you the, the theory of how to do it, but they're not necessarily doing it themselves. And it's like... Um, it's interesting. I think that going back to what you said, what, what, what you put in is what you get out. I would encourage everyone listening to this podcast to try to do 10% more. That's it. Don't try and, because most people think I got to do so. Don't just do 10% more. If you go to the gym for an hour, do an hour and 10 minutes, an hour, or an hour and six minutes. I mean, just do 10% more and you'd be, it does make a huge difference, but with purpose. <clears throat> so it's not a case of just watch the clock do it with purpose yeah i think that's um it's a, such a great uh, statement to say about doing things with purpose and again it's not it's, it goes back to that four-year-old it was the four-year-old doesn't suddenly learn to walk and then the next day can run a marathon no um, they take those incremental steps all the time which is over a journey will allow them to run a marathon well, well it's the same with relationships you know often i i hear people saying oh I've met this person, they want to get really serious. And I go, well, you can't get really serious until you've, you know, <clears throat> become best friends. And you've, you know, you can't go from, I don't know this person to we're going to move in together in two weeks. <laughs> That's just my take on it. And I think everything has a, a natural, for some people, it maybe it, it, they go through the whole, all the process to get there in two weeks. But on average, we need to learn to, to crawl and then to walk and then to walk quickly, then to jog, and then to run, then to sprint. There's a sequence. Cool. I've, there's, um, I've got one more question around, around you, and then we've got the end of all our podcasts for all the people that we uh, have the pleasure and we learn from. We ask them some revolutionary questions, but I'm fascinated by your awesome eight golf challenge. Um, I've, I've started to do a few things that mentally and physically challenging challenged me i recently ran a did a trail run which was 110 kilometers over three days oh which was a gosh. that was a push for me um but your tell me more about this awesome eight golf challenges you hold your world record holder i am i am i for over 25 years i've been involved in sponsoring an orphanage in thailand for blind children and I raised the money for them in the year 2000 by running the marathon in New York. And I went out there to meet these children I'd been sponsoring. And I was so taken by it, I wanted to raise more money. 
I spoke to a friend of mine who has uh, done the seven summits in the North and South Pole, very adventurous, ex-commando, ex-SAS guy. And he said, golf's a bit of a girly game, isn't it? I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, there's no extreme version of golf. And I said, well, <laughs> not all, but there could be. And then he said, well, the most, what's the highest course? I said, I don't know. He goes, well, what's the coldest course? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, let's do them. So we came up with this idea to find the eight most extreme golf course in the world, the highest, the lowest, the hottest, the coldest, the most northern, the most southern, the greatest and the most difficult. And we called it the awesome eight. And we decided we had to do it under one calendar year. And when we got to Fairbanks, Alaska, on the 21st of December, 2001, it was minus 35 degrees centigrade. But when we played, it was minus 26. And we played 18 holes in five hours at minus 26. We went to Australia, where we played Alice Springs at 46 degrees centigrade. We played in Hawaii in 45 mile an hour winds. We played, so we did the awesome, we played these eight extreme golf courses. And then we got a website about it. And since then, three people have completed it. So in, it's the most exclusive golf society in the world. <laughs> Fantastic. It's the most amazing golf society, only a total of five members. And you have to play those eight courses in under one calendar year. And you have to carry your clubs. No caddies allowed. <laughs> Fantastic. And all for an incredible cause as well. Oh, that's kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, as well. And I'm still, I'm still working with the charities after all these years. So a pleasure to do that. So uh, wrap up, got, um, like I said, one or two questions that we ask all our, all our guests. Um, so how would you want people to describe you in 50 years time? Uh, you know, it's a nice question. I would like to be described as a humble man who genuinely cared about the human condition and did my best to make a positive impact in the lives of other people. It's a great legacy to have. Um, and if your child or loved one asked you for your the most important lesson that you've learned uh, that you're going to pass on to them, what would you tell them? I would tell them learn from failure, but never identify with failure. We're all going to fail, but some people identify with it and go, oh, I'm a loser, I'm a failure. A four-year-old child doesn't identify with it, it learns from it. So my advice would be learn from failure, but never identify with it. Fantastic. Um, so I'd just like to um, thank you, Robin, uh, so much for, for choosing to be here today. We've talked a lot about uh, fears and joys and being purposeful and and that all comes back to the choices that we make. Um, and obviously, I'm very, very grateful that you've chosen to spend time with us today on this podcast. And just to reiterate again, and thank you for, for the books you've written, uh, the insights that you have and you, and you shared. Um, and you've definitely left me with two or three things that firstly reaffirm how I'm raising my son. Uh, and that's, it's always nice when you speak to uh, an expert a guru like yourself and you're going actually I'm doing an okay job with my my eight-year-old boy um, but also in terms of reminding me about what we need to do as we work with with others both in a day-to-day -day environment also in a in a high uh, an elite sport environment and and with just the fellow human beings around what are we doing to make people feel special to feel important so Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your insights. Uh, really appreciate it. I'm sure the audience has got a massive amount of practical actions that they're going to take out of this. That was fantastic. Mark, it's been my pleasure to do that with you. You know, leave one thought for your listeners. And I say this, I said, never talk to yourself the way you would talk to someone you loved. Be kind to yourself. Too many people are their own worst critic. So my final thought for you all is be kind to yourself. And that kindness goes throughout the world and it makes it for a kind of world thanks a lot robin thank you my pleasure take care so there you have it amazing actionable content ideas and concepts for you to improve the quality of your life your business and possibly your golf from the wonderful mr robin Seeger. Robin, thank you very much for your time today. I know our audience appreciates it. And guys and girls, if you want to get in touch with Robin, you can find his web details, social media details, and all of the details to go and get his books and get work with him in the descriptions beneath.
This podcast, as with all of the Business Revolutionary podcasts, are brought to you by the Tetraki Business Revolution Club, our free offer of free business coaching to you and anyone that you know. No catches, no credit cards, and no commitments. Check out the link in the description below. As ever, I hope you have an amazing week going forwards and realize that you truly are a business revolutionary.